everybody. Um, welcome to our Science Chapter 1 review. This is for Monday, uh, March 30th. Um, I have a squeaky chair. It's kind of driving me nuts, but that's all right. We'll make it work. Um, so this will be the only video, actually, that you guys see for science this week. Um, that's because there's a pretty big assignment worth 50 points that is going to be like your finale for chapter one. Um, you will have all the way till Sunday to do it. So um, you don't have to rush, can go back in and out of that and answer the questions and read all the directions really carefully. But today I wanted to do a little bit of prep for that. Um, so my little, um, I guess my little challenge for myself was, could I fit all of chapter one on this dry erase board? And holy cow, it took me about an hour, but um, I think I may have gotten almost everything I'm going to cover today with you guys on here. So um, I do realize you may not be able to see all of this. It's a lot to process. So I took some photos. Those will be uploaded onto the science topic page for you guys in case you want to see what the heck was up there um, a little later and look at it a little closer. Okay. Um, so without further ado, I made some little flashcards we're going to go through with some notes on them. So things to, that um, will definitely help on the big assignment that you're going to work on. Um, you can use your book for the assignment. You can use the YouTube videos for the assignment. You can use um, the notes that are provided that accompany the YouTube videos. Um, those are also under topic two for science. And you can use each other too. I just ask that you guys actually discuss. Um, don't just try to get an answer from someone. And you may not know that that's actually correct either. So you might not want to always trust that. So talk about it with people. I love that some of you guys are doing that. That's an awesome, awesome, awesome thing. So without further ado, we're going to take a look at the first term. Um, and it all has to do with why water is so important. If you remember back to lesson one, and these will go in order from lesson one, two, three, and four, all of chapter one. Um, why was water so important for organisms? One of the first things we talked about was it helps them to grow. You can't grow unless you can constantly regenerate cells, right? And we talked a lot about how cells are at least 70% water. Um, so without water, if your cells can't replenish themselves, then your body doesn't do the same. Any organism can't do the same. And um, it would be really hard to grow and survive. So grow is definitely an important one. With that also, digestion. We can't digest our food without water. Um, so that's really important. When we digest food, that helps us get the nutrients to our body. So that is one, an, one other huge reason why um, water is so, so, so important to all organisms. And to reproduce. To reproduce, an, uh, when an organism reproduces, we have to have the rebirth of cells. Cells need to be generated. And again, because cells are made mostly of water, and our bodies are made of mostly of water, um, we can't reproduce, organisms cannot reproduce unless they have water. So those were the top three. The fourth one that I know some of you are probably saying right now, Mrs. B, isn't there a fourth one that we had to know? Um, the fourth one was that they use water to get materials from their surrounding environment. So that's, that's also a really, really great one too. Those first three are your kind of top priority reasons why water is so important to all organisms. All right. So we're going on to photosynthesis. That's the next one. So I drew my little sun here. Now, you guys are aware that some organisms can make their own food and some cannot. They have to actually go get it. So I put up on the board in the top, well, that would be your left, um, that plants and algae have to use photosynthesis in order to produce their food. And that's when they take carbon dioxide with water added with the energy from sunlight, and they can produce their natural sugars, which is like their food source, um, and oxygen, which that's why we need plants for us so that we can then take in the oxygen. That whole process is photosynthesis. Another little term for um, organisms that can produce their own food is called an autotroph. Auto meaning they can like automatically, so that prefix auto, um, produce their own food. So plants and algae, just like the board says up there, um, they produce their own food through the process of photosynthesis. So again, those are called autotrophs. Um, all right, let's go on to the next one. Next one is habitat. 
And that one was pretty awesome for you guys. You've been always able to tell me what a habitat is, where an organism can live and survive, and it has everything it needs to be able to survive <clears throat> in that particular type of climate. So they're adapted to that habitat, to survival. Um, one question that was on our last quiz, it was, seems like so, so, so long ago, was what type of habitat, I'm gonna pause for a minute to see if you guys could give you a thinking moment, what type of habitat has the most variety of organisms? And that answer is aquatic. Uh, so water habitats, streams, lakes, rivers, oceans, um, oceans especially. There are some organisms deep, 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 deep down that we may not even, we don't know about yet. And um, many, many, many um, in the aquatic habitats. So the aquatic habitats have the most variety of organisms. So remember that one, you'll need it. All right, oceans. So this one, I did this little graph pie, pie, uh, chart for you guys. We have 90% of the water is found in the ocean, so salt water, which isn't readily usable. We can use it in some fashion, but it's not readily usable. The water that is our fresh water is that little teeny tiny carrot of 3%. You probably remember this pie chart, it's on your notes. Um, we had done that several, talked about that several times. Out of that little teeny tiny 3%, out of that little carrot, most of that, um, most of our fresh water, and I've got it on one of these cards, but we really don't, I guess I don't need it, would be in the North and South Poles. Um, so that is where we find that most of our fresh water is actually in the glaciers. Um, a good percentage of that 3%, like two thirds of that 3% is in the glaciers. The rest of our fresh water that we, some of it we can access, I just put some, things on here. Again, this is all in your notes, but streams, rivers, lakes, groundwater, ponds, um, those are other freshwater areas that are a little more accessible to us. Okay, now the next one I want to talk about was groundwater. And that is where you can find the most fresh water. Um, the easier place to actually get the fresh water from, and I'm not sure that I had it up here, but the easier place for us to get our fresh water would be from streams, lakes, and rivers because it's right there for us and we don't have to drill wells to go in and do that. But um, where we actually have the most water, fresh water, is actually beneath the surface. So that would be in our groundwater. Okay. So we find more fresh water in our groundwater. All right. The next thing we talked about, we talked about a lot in this chapter. <laughs> is the water cycle. Now I had fun with this one. I'm gonna move over to show you guys. I really like drawing this one. Um, I tried to bubble it in in the black there. So the water cycle, which we had a little confusion on um, when I was asking you guys a long a while back to um, tell me the order, explain the order. So we've got the evaporation, the water coming off the lake, which is in liquid form, so the L I didn't have enough space, so L represents liquid to gas, is evaporating, going into the clouds where it condenses. And then that liquid, once those clouds have enough in them to precipitate, that's what happens. So then we have the process, so it's in this order, evaporation, condensation, precipitation, that can be, I'll talk about that a little bit in a little more detail soon, but snow, sleet, rain, hail all of those things what we've talked about. Precipitation, now that precipitation can go down. Most of it will go into the oceans actually, because that's our largest um, area. The, much of the earth is covered in water. So a lot of times the precipitation goes right there and collects in the oceans and other waterways. Um, but of course we have some that goes down into the ground. So we call this area, whether it's water or land, that would be our collection of water. And then drew a little bit of our um, what happens with the leaves of different trees and plants. The leaves also give off <clears throat> water, which is called transpiration. So, and then that will evaporate into the air also. So transpiration is the water coming off the leaves that evaporates eventually. So that is our water cycle. And then obviously that continues all over again. Can't do without it. All right, rivers and lakes. 
is our next one. And I talked about this one already. So that's again, the easiest way that we can get our, um, the easiest way for us to get our fresh water. <coughs> All right, I'm gonna scoot over again. Sorry, just so you guys can see most of this board. All right, the magic number we talked about so many times before we left, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. I've got my little thermometer. Hopefully you can see it squeezed in there. Th thermometer over here. And I've got it hitting 32 degrees where water freezes. So at 32, it will freeze. And I think you guys probably could all tell me what type of precipitation results in um, from that from hitting that temperature or below it. That would be the snow, the hail, the sleet. All of that is kind of mixed with ice. If it's ice, it's freezing, so below 32. Uh, 32 or, or below, excuse me. If you are above 32, then um, we are looking at rain. So that is when we have rainfall. All right, everybody, moving on. Our next word is gravity. And that I put up there um, as an important term because that's what pulls the precipitation down toward the ground. So without that gravity, we don't have precipitation, which means the whole water cycle wouldn't happen. So gravity, again, a force that's very, very, very important with that. All right, next one is a tributary. A tributary, some of you might remember, and by the way, this is on the Quizlet that can be found under the Topics 2 page and in the notes. <coughs> There's a really good um, picture of it, I believe, on both too. So if you need to kind of look at that again. Um, but those are all the rivers and streams that feed into a larger river. Okay, so again, the little rivers and streams that feed into a larger river. Ponds and lakes. And I'm just going to put this one down because I've got this one up here for you guys. So how are they different from one another? A pond, I'll read this in case you can't see it. A pond is much more shallow than a lake. The sun can reach the bottom of the pond, which means that many plants and algae can grow really, really well. They also can produce oxygen, which then is really important to the fish and other organisms that live in the pond. So there are many plants and organisms um, and ponds are generally smaller in size. The lake, pretty much the opposite. Um, they're usually larger, deeper, the sun isn't so great at reaching to the bottom, so you don't see as many plants on the bottom. So fewer plants, fewer organisms. But you will find um, different kinds of bony fish and some mollusks and some worms. Uh, we did talk about the term mollusks, but if you need a refresher, that would be things like snails and mussels. Generally, they have shells, little creatures that have shells. And they love the sandy bottom of a lake, um, so that's kind of where they like to be. So you should know the differences between pond and a lake. All right, lake formation. How did lakes form? And how does that happen over time? Um, we talked a lot about how at the end of the ice age, those huge ice sheets melted. And as they melted, they were cutting into the earth and caused these um, sort of like depressions. It kind of cut the area out. Um, so that was one reason. And when that area was cut out, it slowly filled with water over time. Another way is that if a river, uh, a river can kind of wind itself through obstacles and sometimes it can lead the river path to go off in different directions and that, that standing water can become a lake over time. We also talked about the Earth's crust shifting. Underneath us, as the Earth's crust shifts, um, it can create valleys, so lakes can form in those down, downward areas called the valleys. And empty volcanoes, the craters, they can fill in there. And when lava or um, mud flows from a volcano, it can also block the river, which means it would kind of cut it off and cause it to turn into a lake over time. So those are your types, or ways, I should say, that a lake can be formed. Next one. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm actually recording on a Sunday and this, it's right about when this rain is supposed to hit. So like, let's say a little prayer that we don't lose power. 
<laughs> a reservoir. Reservoir is pretty easy. That's just a large area that is filled with water and it's really stored for human use. You guys are most familiar with the dams. Um, a dam is a man-made area where it's like this huge um, storage area for water. And again, they use that for human use or um, could be farm use, things like that. That is a reservoir. Eutrophication, my favorite word. Eutrophication can happen naturally or it can happen unnaturally. Um, naturally is when you get that algae buildup on the top of a leak. I don't think I put that one, drew a picture of that on there, but you get, uh, there is a picture in the Quizlet and on the notes. You get a thick layer of algae. And the, the reason that that overgrowth happens um, is because when organisms die in a pond area, lake area, um, that build up the decomposition kind of builds up and the algae sort of feed off of those nutrients, mostly nitrogen and phosphorus. So we'll talk more about those in chapters to come, but nitrogen and phosphorus, the algae love that and it ends up building up and causes this thick um, sort of layer that eventually will fill the whole lake. Okay, so that is eutrophication. Now the unnatural way that we talked about was um, fertilizers that run off from farms. If those get into a lake, it actually causes that whole process of the algae growth to go even faster because more nitrogen and phosphorus are often being pushed into the lake unnaturally. So that whole process again happens a lot quicker. Not so healthy for that lake. All right, you guys were pretty good from the discussion board on permeable and impermeable. So I've got them both. Permeable, permeable would be like uh, a lot of people said they're bath sponges just like I kind of showed you in with Tristan with that little video. Um, a bath sponge has those larger holes, lots of spaces in between for the water to fall through. So that would be permeable. Many pores, large spaces, water easily passes through. Okay, or some other liquid. Impermeable, the opposite, where you don't get water passing through very easily. Many of you said um, your granite countertops at home, which I thought was a great example because why did someone think to use granite or marble for a kitchen top? Because the water wouldn't go through, right? They would last like literally forever. Um, so granite and clay are great examples. Really um, tight material, tight pores, not a lot of wiggle room for any water to get through. So that's a great, those are great examples of impermeable. The water table, I've got this one up on the board. The water table is the one that uh, Tristan and I created for you guys. We used it in a former lesson uh, last week. And up at the top, right up, right underneath the grass, you have your unsaturated area. There was some confusion with folks reversing unsaturated and saturated. Saturated is the area that is filled with water, um, whereas unsaturated is there. It isn't filled with water. It's just the opposite of that. So if I saturate a sponge in order to wash my car or wash the dishes. It's, it's literally soaking wet. It's holding a lot of that water, it's saturated. So you can think of it that way if that helps. Now at the top of the saturation zone, right at the top, we hit those blue lines, which is the water table. And I put a little note over to, uh, it would be your right, to get water from an aquifer. Okay, and we'll talk about those in a minute. You would drill a well to that point or below. That's where you're gonna hit the water. Okay, so again, the water table is right at the tippy top of that level of the saturation zone. Unsaturated zone is right above that. Okay, that is the water table. Aquifers. Aquifers are natural areas of water that are below the ground. And people can, in order to get the water, people have to drill at the water table, near the water table level, in order to get that water to, to be pulled up. Um, you guys answered a question for me on the, uh, the assignment that said, what happens if um, the people of an area are pulling out a ton of water from an aquifer for crops, for livestock, the farm animals, um, again, the crops, and for, for just general people use, if they are using it, and most of you got this correct, if they're using it so much where the aquifer cannot naturally refill itself, then that's definitely gonna cause damage to that aquifer and those people 
um, will not have a replenished water supply. They're going to have to move on to another area to drill or simply wait for the aquifer to refill. So just something to, to note about that. Most of you got that right, like I said. An artesian well, these are really interesting. Um, so this is a well that can release water naturally um, because the pressure is so much between the two, lock, lock, two uh, sedimentary rock layers. So there's two sedimentary rock layers with the water in between them. And what happens is if that top layer of rock gets punctured, if, if somehow um, there, there's an opening or crack to it, the water, because of the pressure, will actually shoot out on its own. So that's what's kind of unique about an artesian well. There's that natural pressure there that can cause uh, the water to be released. Um, let's see what else. I think I have one more. And then after we talked about those, we touched on wetlands. That one I do have up there. Oh, let's see our wetlands right here. <laughs> we have three types that we talked about. That was a bog which is generally a cooler climate, usually in the northern um, areas. There are mosses there and they love, love, love the water because it has an acidic quality to it. And that is a bog, okay? Marsh, oh, by the way, that was the answer on that homework with the photo, um, was, was a bog. So great job for you guys who got that. Marsh, um, a very grassy area with cattails. Again, those long um, kind of, uh, they have green and then the sort of soft brown part at the top. Those are cattails. Sometimes we see them as we're driving by in the country, in the ditches, things like that. Um, marshes are very shallow um, traditionally too. And a swamp, more in the southern region, hot, humid areas. Um, and they, they really do look like flooded forests. There were a few examples in your book and I pulled a couple more pictures for the assignment you guys will do today. Um, and they really do look like flooded forests. The, um, you will see very, very tall trees and they're just submerged at the bottom with water. And then sometimes these shrubs or bushes that are sprouting out. Um, so that is one distinct feature of a swamp is you see those massively tall trees. The other thing to know about our wetlands that just a reminder are the two main um, functions really, how they help us, and that would be to control flooding because they can filter out a lot of water and hold a lot of water. And then two, it's for habitats for so many different organisms. So without the wetlands, we, um, we would be at a loss, definitely, so. All right, so hopefully this isn't too overwhelming for you guys. Again, I'll have photos. Um, you're gonna take a 50 point, uh, you'll do a 50 point assignment on the whole chapter. And again, you have all these resources to use and again, use each other. Um, you'll have until Sunday to complete that. So I won't see you again for another science video for this week, um, but look out for um, an online Jeopardy game. I will send you guys the link to that. There will be a Jeopardy game you can play um, to practice some of this material um, midway through the week. And um, again, I hope everybody's well and definitely miss you guys. Um, I was feeling it even more today. Really wish I could go back to school. Um, but you know what? As long as you're safe and healthy and, and awesome, that's all that matters. So we will see you soon. Have a great night.